Well, as you know, in his book, or the volume, part one, I think it is, I forget. Church Dogmatics. Church yeah. Dogmatics. When KD he, for the for Yeah, the, the Church Dogmatics. He tells the reader that now that he's come, after having dealt broadly with the doctrine of God and his attributes and the Trinity in earlier volumes, he comes to the subject of election, and he, he tells you right up front that at this point, though I have great appreciation for Calvin and I have little or no appreciation for the Arminian position that he explicitly repudiates, uh, I, have to, I have to offer a revision. And it's a revision, as I argue in my chapter, that is born out of a judgment that in its traditional formulation, whether in Augustine or then subsequently at the time of the Reformation, especially in Calvin and in Reformed theology, the idea of election and reprobation, however you precisely define and describe reprobation, how you relate those two aspects of God's decree, he um, he's of the persuasion that this undermines among other things, the confidence that we may have that God is to use a favorite expression of his for us in Christ, so that he wants to, as is consistent with his theology generally, mm -hmm. know nothing of who God is, the God triune, apart from what he wills to be in the eternal word who becomes flesh in the fullness of time and order to fulfill what God in his self-determination, his will to be this God and none other, and to make himself known as such as the God who is for us in Jesus Christ. So you don't have a doctrine of God's purpose of election from before the foundation of the world in Christ to elect some particular persons, a definite number of persons, who together constitute the whole of the new humanity in Christ. I throw that in there because I'm appreciative of Bob Inc.'s worry about if you so accent specific definite number, he affirms, you tend to lose sight of the fact that this is the organism, to use a Bavinkian expression, yeah, very much so. of the whole of that new humanity that God is pleased to save and ultimately to glorify, perfect in Christ um, in fulfillment of his purpose. But you have a doctrine of a double decree where some persons, definite number, particular persons known to God, are chosen unto everlasting life. Other persons are passed by or left from whom God withholds justly, they're undeserving, they have no claim upon his favor, treats them in his justice, uh, condemning them for their sins according to his purpose and will, not to, in mercy, elect them unto salvation. Uh, and Barth's worry, and you know, I can't get into all the details, but he rather radically revises the notion of election reprobation to be the election of Christ to be both representative man as the elect one and all of humanity in him elect, and to take upon himself in Christ that reprobation and condemnation under his judgment that all of humanity deserves, so that reprobation in a manner of speaking has been assumed into God. He assumes and bears that for all human beings, so that if you have a Christologically based knowledge of humanity or the doctrine of man, as a human being, my identity is determined by who I am by virtue of God's self-determination, to be the God who elects me and is for me and is gracious toward me and only gracious, which uh, as you well know from the language of Bart, grace triumphs always. God's yes is not paralleled by his no. It's always predominant, superseding, and ultimately obliterating. So that's what leads, I'm going a little too quickly here, but it's what leads Bart to uh, right. the whole question of universalism. Right, exactly. Because he has a doctrine of universal atonement. He has a doctrine of universal election. All are 
we are by virtue of God's determination to identify us in the person of his own son and in his will to elect him as elect man, that's my identity. So the gospel is proclaimed in the form of this is who you are. It's good news and only good news. It's yes and ultimately only yes. It's grace toward any and all without exception, which if you were to think, and I argue this in, in the chapter on Bart, if you were to think that through consequentially, it doesn't seem to me possible to do what Bart surprisingly does, and that is refuses to actually affirm universalism. He doesn't deny it. He, he determines quite explicitly neither to affirm nor to deny. Well, that's very well and good, but the theological underpinnings for a necessarily consequent universalist conclusion are all there. Yeah, I agree. Uh, which is why you have a big debate among Bart scholars. Was he a sure. universalism, universalist, or wasn't he? And I argue, actually, in my book, some things that I don't think too many people have argued, although I cite some other sources, that one of the mysteries of Bart's doctrine of election is that everything that he aims to achieve, he, in a manner of speaking, loses at the end when he's pressed on this, this question of universalism. Because if God is willing to grant the possibility of the impossible, namely a person who refuses to accept the good word that God speaks toward him in Christ, such a person is not saved, uh, you, you're back in an almost semi, uh, almost Arminian view of yeah. God's purpose, his self-determination, his ultimate good, gracious will in Christ mm -hmm. is ineffectual. Mm 